Gurus, uh, willkommen in einem and in another Fregens video. Oh, welcome to yet another exciting video. In this case, part 40 of my figure gaming hobby series. In this case, I'll be investigating and basing 6mm Napoleonics and also to a lesser extent ancient figures. Main object objective is to determine the optimal basing system, which is both practical and looks good for 6mm. Before I go into the video, just a few caveats. So while this video does in theory cover ancients as well as Napoleonics. The main focus is Napoleonics. I've only included ancients in this video as I have a current 6 mil army, which is an ancients army. I've not actually embased any Napoleonic figures, that is 6 mil Napoleonic figures yet for myself. As a result, all the images of Napoleonic figures in this video have come from the internet. They are not my figures. This video is based on my research on how to base Napoleonic figures, which is why I have used images from the internet. I use these images to determine for myself how I should base the 6mm figures that I will be soon purchasing. To assist me in my determination of how to base figures, I'm using an early attempt that I made of basing 6mm ancients in order to assist me in determining what works and what does not work. I've made many errors in the distant past with 6mm ancient figures and I want to avoid any issues with my new Napoleonic figures. However, saying all that, the observations made in this video is nonetheless applicable to ancients. My other caveat that I wish to raise is that uh, I am not pretending to have a perfect solution and a player's decision on how to base their figures will depend on the rules they wish to use. I normally use rules which allow me to refight entire battles, from Napoleonic Leipzig to ancient Cane. Thus I have different objectives to someone who wishes to only command a French brigade, for example. So now let's move on to the basing. As with all other scales, there are many different basing systems which suit different rules for 6mm. The primary basing metric is the base width which can range from 2 cm wide to 6 cm wide, and in some very rare cases, larger 7.5 cm, for example, is used commonly with one particularly well-known set of rules. The depth is highly variable, and many rules really don't care about the depth. This is often left up to the player to decide. This decision can be critical in terms of how the figures look, or the elements look at least. If we look at a standard 4cm wide by 1.5cm deep base at the top, we can either base the 6mm figures in one or two ranks. This shows a maximum density of 8 figures wide in this case, which I find a bit tight, but is a standard basing density for close order. I sometimes base 5 figures wide for my ancients uh, on 3cm bases, but this is only because the H&R or Heroic and Ross figures comes in strips of 5, and not for uh, reasons of optimal density. With Bacchus, I will try the ideal density of two figures per one centimetre, which tends to be the basing density that most people use. I normally use a base width of two centimetres, or base depth of two centimetres, and spread my lines out a bit, as I feel this looks better. I do this both for Napoleonics and Ancients, and generally have no major rules impact by using this slightly deeper base. When looking or comparing the one rank versus two rank, I personally feel two rank looks better. The images on the right uh, show you what two rank looks um, using four centimeter wide bases, which also happen to be one and a half centimeter deep. I tried two ranks for my 15 mil figures back in the old days, and I did not like the effect, so my initial inclination was to go for a single rank, but uh, after doing a bit of experimentation, for 6mm, 2 rank is ideal, or it's an ideal look. For light infantry, using 4cm wide bases, I use 8 figures, which is what you would normally place in a single rank of close order light infantry, and spread them around a bit. I still typically use 2cm deep bases in this case. However, most players use the 1.5cm deep bases, as you can see on the left here, and also on the image. If we use the exact same base, I can fit 6 cavalry in a single rank. 
This does depend on the figure and it's possible to place cavalry on a one and a half centimetre deep base as well. But I normally go with two centimetres and if you're using slightly larger than normal six mil figures, it, you know, particularly if there's a tail sticking out the back, it's probably best to go for a two centimetre deep. But as you can see here, most people use 1.5 centimetre deep bases. When we come to skirmish cavalry bases, the recommendation, as you can see here, is to use a deeper base. In this case, a double depth, which is 30 millimetres or three centimetres. Now, I would normally just use a standard two centimetre deep, and then when I base my cavalry, I would just make it a little bit more disordered. I do like having all the bases the same size, particularly if I'm going to be using movement trays. This shows the artillery base. As you can see here, the standard artillery base is three centimetres deep, that is the four centimetres wide. You can see that it normally uses two artillery pieces on it to give the element sufficient uh, oomph, I suppose. For myself, I stay with my standard two centimetre deep base and it seems more than adequate. If we move to horse artillery, I basically base it exactly the same. The only difference is I normally try and place a, a cavalry piece on it or a mounted crewman on the base to indicate that it's horse artillery. The other way that I indicate horse artillery is I paint the, uh, the actual gun a bronze rather than an iron colour. However, with 6mm that's a little bit more difficult to see than let's say 15mm. When we move to commanders, in the past I normally used standard bases but um, I've abandoned that and now adopt the round base idea. It does work better, I find. Uh, however, it does depend on the rules. Once again, I try and stay with a two centimetre depth, uh, particularly for the sub-commanders. So I normally would use a two centimetre circle for sub-commanders and to indicate the CNC, a three centimetre base and increase the number of figures on it. But the size probably is irrelevant and players could use any particular size they wish. As you can see here, the commanders are on a two and a half um, centimetre round base. So in summary, it's a reasonable strategy basing six mil on a four centimetre wide base. However, in my case, I possess a very large 15 mil force mix, which uses the same base width. And as a result, I've determined there's no point for me to go down this path any more than I have at the present moment. If you do not possess a 15mm force mix with 4cm wide bases and wish to only purchase a 6mm force mix, then using 4cm wide bases can make a lot of sense. I mean, in the Ancients arena, most 6mm figures are based on a 4cm wide base. Napoleonics, less so. You get a wider variety for Napoleonics. The other reason why I'm not really too keen about using, let's say, a 15mm basing size for 6mm is that I feel it did not, you know, use the full potential of 6mm figures. Um, like what you can see on the right there are standard 15mm bases, um, 4 centimetres wide, 1.5 centimetre deep. They could be um, using 15mm figures or 6mm figures. And I, I think that if you're going down the 6mm path, you're probably looking for a very different aesthetic. So as a result, I made the decision to move to a different basing system to see if I could get a real different aesthetic from using 6mm compared to 15mm. I decided to experiment with 6cm wide bases, which is a basing system used by a series of popular rules. My initial thought was a 2cm base width or depth. But as you can see here, a three centimeter deep base is also used. And what you can see here is that you get more diorama visible. If you go down the three centimeter deep base, there are large gaps at the front and rear of the base, which is not an issue if your elements are all in a line, but you quickly notice it when the bases form up in a column. However, this is dependent on the rules, and with the rules I use, uh, this effect that you see here never occurs and it's not an issue. One option that you uh, can have as a result, as long as you're pleased with the aesthetics that you see here and your rules support it, 
is by increasing the depth of the bass so you can add even more features on your bass to give you a nicer impact or nicer feel. In this example we see cavalry and mass on quite deep bases, 4cm wide and 3cm deep. The gaps between the lines can be off-putting for some players, but I tend to not mind. Again, this is due to the rules I use. Look, one way of looking at this is that um, each line represents an individual regiment. And of course, you would expect a larger than normal gap to the regiment to the front. However, if you're looking at a set of rules where each row here represents a squadron, and you want, or even less, and you want two rank squadrons, uh, then you're not going to get the effect that you wish. Although, I must admit, with three centimetre bases, you do have the option of putting a second row of cavalry there, if you so desire. However, in my case, I find the additional benefit of additional depth is that you can place more terrain on it, or, in this case, place skirmishes in front of a line and you achieve a much nicer effect. What you see here is two ranks, then a big gap at the front where you've got your skirmishes. The other advantage of increasing the depth is you can standardise on a single base size. In this case, the additional depth is being used to represent skirmish cavalry, you know, the cavalry scattered all over the base accordingly. I really do find having a single base size for all troop types a real benefit. If you take this to the extreme and move to a full 6cm square base, you can uh, place your skirmishes in a much more realistic manner and even have some terrain features there where your skirmishes can hide behind. I do find that this effect looks really nice. There are many ways you can deploy your figures onto a large base of this nature. In this case, we're forming two columns on your deep base with some skirmishes in the front. This works extremely well with large-scale rules, where each base represents, let's say, two battalions. While I think these large bases look really nice and offer you a lot of additional uh, benefits, I find the larger base bases limits me to the, stuff that, the number of rules that um, I can play. In summary, the type of rules that these bases are most suited to tend to be the abstract big base type game systems. Nonetheless, if you do enjoy these large base rules, you know, Blucher, for example, is one example, then the larger bases give you the opportunity to play, let's say, dice-based strength markers on your base, as you can see here, which is a great idea, uh, although I would use a green dice rather than the blue dice, as well as other kind of markers if you want to, for example, indicate what the formation is. Now, I personally do not like visible labels uh, on my base because I think they detract, but other people absolutely adore them. Nonetheless, I do kind of like the dice here. I would use almost certainly green dice to try and make it match to the terrain as much as possible. But this is actually a very nice way of indicating strength for your large bases, which some rules do require. The base I showed earlier with the two dice used 7.5 squares rather than 6 cm squares. I would go with the 6 cm because there are other rules that use it. This, this indicates a number of other formations that you can actually use on your big base if you so desire. While I seriously did consider these big, the big base approach, in the end I decided to veer away from it. It was just too limiting to me. Instead, I then swung to an even smaller base, in this case a 2cm wide base. These are 2cm squares, and after trying in the past 2cm wide by 1cm deep bases with 6mm, I find these square bases much easier to pick up. I use a 3mm thick MDF base, which makes it easier to pick up again. But the biggest problem with 2cm wide bases is that they can become extremely fiddly and difficult to move around. By using a square and using a nice thick base, that tends to overcome that problem. The main reason why I went down the 2cm wide base, or at least at this particular point, and I still may come back to it um, after abandoning it for a short while is that the small bases actually provide significant gain benefits. 
The smaller bases allow you to either have larger battles, which tends not to be the direction that I go down, but more importantly, allow you to use smaller playing areas, which I feel is a real sweet spot with these smaller bases. What we can see here is the kind of basing strategy for a 2 centimeter square base, and it's certainly a viable path to go down. However, after looking around my clubs, etc., and contacting a number of people, very few players have gone down this particular basing direction. I'm uncertain why, but perhaps the elements are still too fiddly to play with. On the other hand, one big benefit with 2 centimeter wide bases is you can construct 4 centimeter wide bases and even 6 centimeter wide bases out of them. I use movement trays a lot, but you need to note that if you do use movement trays, your elements, or your big elements, are one centimetre wider due to the lip on the movement tray. If that's not an issue, then this is a viable option of creating a single basing system, two centimetre squares, which can accommodate four centimetre wide bases or six centimetre wide bases. While I'll almost certainly go down the two centimeter square bases for ancients, for Napoleonics I'm not quite sure if this is the correct course of action. As a result, I've decided to go down the three centimeter square bases. Now the reason why I picked three centimeter square is that that happens to be the base size of my World War II, Cold War and modern six mil bases. And I know they work well, I've used them over and over again, and I know it's practical, which is the reason why I almost certainly go down this path for Napoleonics. Now what you can see here on the left is possible element structures. The top would be a line, so you have your two ranks at the front and a couple of uh, figures at the front to indicate skirmishes. The middle one could be something that you could use to depict light infantry and the bottom would be what you would use to depict um, skirmishes. Now you could depict the light infantry by uniforms as well, so Grens, Austrian Grens would be brown rather than white. Uh, French light infantry would have a lighter colour than, let's say, their line infantry, and Russian um, Yaga would have also some different shade of green. Um, I think from memory it's possibly a bit lighter shade than the line infantry, although shades of colour is notoriously difficult to pin down in the Napoleonic period. Often when something was a lighter shade, it wasn't meant to be lighter, it just happened to be more weathered. When we move to cavalry, at the top we would have our standard formation for heavy cavalry and you'd have, oh you'd actually use that for heavy and light cavalry and you'd differentiate the two by the figure on top. And if you do have skirmish cavalry, which is not that common in Napoleonic, then you would just simply scatter them around as you can see at the bottom. And finally we look at artillery. At the top we have the um, foot artillery. Now you'll notice here I only have one piece of artillery on this rather than two. I think it actually works better for three centimetre square bases. And at the bottom would be my horse artillery element. Um, and I've got a horse on there, a crew member on a horse, to indicate that it's horse artillery. This generally represents all the troops I would normally need in a Napoleonic battle. Now, of course, quality of troops, superior, ordinary, inferior troops, would be probably indicated by the figure instead itself. So... You know, grenadiers with their white plumes would be your superior troops. Um, Ragtag landwehr, you know, and uh, painted accordingly, which, which would be your inferior troops, etc. I'm now going to be covering what a player would need to purchase in order to create a 6mm force mix. A quick note, uh, this purchase list that I'll be discussing is based on my focus of refighting entire battles. So it may not be suitable for those players who refight at a brigade or a divisional level. So just take note of that. This shows a typical building block, which is loosely based on the DBM army list. In this case, this is supposed to represent a core, of which I would normally field from between four and six in a typical game. Not all of the elements here would be fielded. So for example, if you're fighting in 1800, you would have more cavalry than artillery. And if you were fighting in 1812, you'd have more artillery than cavalry. The skirmish are a bit problematic. At the scale I normally play, you would very rarely actually have skirmish elements, unless you're going into woods and stuff of that nature. So I'd normally throw in a couple there for those particular cases. Incidentally, the block of nine figures on the, or elements on the left, um, two of them would probably be light and painted accordingly, and one would probably be grenadier. I mean, the composition is entirely up to, you know, the player himself, 
and of course any historical data they have on the core when it fought in the particular battle that you're trying to reproduce. The brand that I'm initially going to look at is Bacchus. Um, now, Bacchus foot come in multiples of 96 and 48 figures. 96 figures gives you six elements of line infantry based on the structure that I showed earlier, and 48 figures give you three elements of line infantry based on the structure I mentioned earlier. If they are skirmish, then you get 16 and, you know, you could get 16 elements if it's 96 figures and eight elements if it's 48 figures respectively. So um, one packet of skirmishes really uh, sort of uh, give you a lot of elements. However, if you purchase skirmishes, some of those figures would go on to your line infantry bases uh, because you need at least four skirmishes per line infantry. A typical force mix should have a minimum of 36 elements of foot. Some of it would be light foot and some would be grenadiers. Thus, you need a minimum of six packets. One packet would probably be a grenadier packet and two would be light infantry packet. At a maximum, you need an extra three packets of foot. Anything beyond that is wasted in most cases. You'll, you'll never use it. You would only need one packet of skirmishes, although this does depend on the rules you are using and how you're going to mix them with your line infantry. Bacchus Cavalry comes in multiples of 45, which means you get 11 elements per packet. If you base your elements 5 to a base, it drops to 9 elements. And I may look at that, but everyone else seems to be basically basing them 2 cavalry per centimetre, so I'm going to be following that. Extra cavalry, nonetheless, is always useful on command bases. As a typical force mix contains no more than 8 to 12 elements of cavalry, you do not need much cavalry. One packet of heavy and one of light is all you need, although I normally get more. It makes me think the density should be closer to 5, or you need to be able to use your cavalry more in other areas. But one point about cavalry is that if you do purchase more than you need, well, if you're feeling a cavalry core, that can actually use up a lot of cavalry. Again, if you're trying to refight a whole battle, most of your cuirassiers and dragoons will be in cavalry corps. So if you're fielding one of them, you're fielding an awful lot of cavalry. If you're not fielding one of them, you're not fielding a lot of cavalry. So I don't think the excess cavalry will be wasted. So I normally get four packets of cavalry for each army. One would be cuirassiers, one would be dragoons, one would be hussars, and the last would be some other light cavalry. Bacchus artillery comes in multiples of four, so that gives you four elements of artillery. A typical force mix would have between eight and twelve elements of artillery, so two packets of foot and one of horse artillery is all you need. Commanders come in multiples of 45 per packet, as a typical force mix would have no more than four to six sub-commanders and one CNC. You probably only need one packet. Some of the foot in the command will go into the line infantry to give it a bit more je ne sais quoi, so to speak. I would also get one packet of limbers. Uh, these can be indicate, uh, used to indicate a horse artillery element. That is, one of the horses there would be used on your horse artillery element. I wouldn't actually field limbers on the playing area. I've got so many limbers at 15 mil, which I never ever use and I wish I never bought. This means a total army could consist of as few as 11 packets of buckets and no more than 18 packets of figures. This will probably have a cost of between 66 and 120 pounds. It's not cheap, but not over the top either. Of course, the bases, of which I use 3 mil MDF bases, will need to be factored in as well. If you're spending 100 pounds on figures, don't skimp on basing. You will really regret it if you do. Now at this point you may be saying that uh, almost no one you know uses 3 cm square bases and this is quite valid. Now in my case I'll be basically purchasing both sides and gaming with people and maybe people will adopt it. But one benefit of using 3 cm bases is that I can put two of them together to create a 6 cm wide base. And there are players that I know that use that construction. If I place them in movement trays, I could play games like Blucher. Now that would require more than two elements. If you wanted to achieve that nice square base effect that uh, I showed you early, then you simply use four elements to achieve that, as you can see on the right. And what I've got there is um, two elements of line at the back and then two elements of skirmishes at the front. Possibly the skirmish density there is a bit higher than it should be and 
probably I would have only four elements or four figures on it, but nonetheless, I think you probably get the idea. Let's look at some aesthetics. This shows some of my old Heroic and Ross Ancient 6mm figures. At this stage, I was basing them five figures wide, as Heroic and Ross offers five figure strips. And that's the only reason why I went five, and as you can see here, five is not adequate. I should have gone six. For Napoleonics, I'll be using Bacchus, which will use six figure wide formation, as I really do feel that looks better. Even if it looks a bit crowded, I think it looks a lot better. What we can see here is some of my ancient cavalry, Persian from memory. Now, in this particular case, I went for three per base, and for Napoleonics, and in the future even for Napoleonics or Ancients, I would go with four per base. Um, once again, I'm not quite sure I went three per base, so I think it was... Um, anyway, when you're experimenting, you do a lot of different things. Um, so four per base will give you a better effect than what you can see here. Mixing and matching the three centimeter square bases can create some interesting combinations. In this case, um, I have javelmen in the front of my phalangites. Thus, if I use larger elements using movement trays, I can create some nice effects. Some of the three centimeter bases may have no figures on them and just terrain features. It's entirely up to the player if you wanted to go down that particular path. My current focus on 3 cm square bases and Napoleonics has taken me a long time to arrive at, or the, my position has taken a long time to arrive at, and I must admit I may decide in the future that it's not optimal, no doubt after I've purchased lots of figures, painted them and based them incorrectly. I hope that I have that will not be the case. However, one of the advantages that I have with 3 cm bases is with movement trays, I can use these bases for big base rules such as Blucher. So, even if I cannot find opponents that have three centimeter square bases, I can still use these figures for players who have blue bases. While for Napoleonics I've certainly fixated on three centimeter square, I am still looking at two centimeter square bases. Many years ago, the mid 1980s to be exact, I based up a Roman and ancient British army using two centimetre wide bases, but found the figures too fiddly. In that case, the depth I used was one centimetre. It could have even been three quarters of a centimetre. By moving to a two centimetre square base, I'm hoping I may avoid that fiddly issue, in which case this may be a valid option for particularly my ancients. The real benefit of using 2 cm square bases is I can pair them up to give me a 4 cm wide bases, so I can game against players who uses that basing system. As the only players that I know with 6mm figures use 4 cm wide bases, and those figures are an ancient army, um, I will almost certainly go down that path for ancients, because that way whatever I base up will be able to be used against those forces, uh, those players who use 4 cm wide bases, and I'll still have the advantage, if I so desire, of using 2 cm wide bases if I want to try and play on a smaller playing area. But for the present moment, for Napoleonics, I'm going to stay with 3 cm square bases because I absolutely know 3 cm square bases are not too fiddly or not too small. The figure to the right, incident, you know, incidentally, the figure to the right is the CNC of this particular army. When I based these figures, I was still using square command elements. I am moving to circle elements, as it makes identifying a commander a lot easier. And so this concludes part 40 of my figure gaming hobby series, in this case, basing 6mm Napoleonic figures, with also some hints on basing ancient figures as well. Once I get my Bacchus 6mm Napoleonic army and paint and base it, I have no doubt I'll create some gameplay videos in the future. Alle guten Dingen, kommen zu einem Ende.